so <laughs> we've got amazing speakers and thank you all for coming, speakers and um, attendees alike. Um, it's, it's something that's begun like a small little idea of like, oh, what about this? And it sort of became a bit bigger. And um, as I reached out to people, um, um, the, the response was overwhelming. So it ended up being three Zooms rather than one. Uh, so there's two more coming up. Um, so I'm a bit overwhelmed by the whole thing. Um, so a lot of people contacted me because they couldn't make it and that's why uh, I'm recording it and hopefully that will work. I've never done it before. Uh, Asmus has joined us, so we've got all our speakers today. Um, apologies from Mia uh, from Denmark because her little boy is ill, so she's going to join in the third Zoom now. Um, so uh, I have muted you all upon entry. Please feel free to unmute yourself to speak. Uh, in the first half, it's going to be sort of speed dating, five minutes, uh, lighting talks um, from everyone to tell us what's going on, where you are um, in theatre. Um, and, uh, and then on the second half, we'll just open it up to absolutely everybody else that wants to join in and ask questions. Um, or have a conversation um, and that's really it and I won't bore you any longer. There's a chat as well you can use, um, post questions if you want or say hello privately or not privately to people. Um, yeah, so we've got a lot to go through. So, um, difficult task of going first <laughs> uh, falls um, with Billy Banks Jones who's a mind soul of Tete -a -tete Festival and he was just, just awarded the British Empire Medal in the Queen's birthday this year and yeah um, for services to opera and diversity nonetheless so there you go. Yes so thank you very much Mayu and um, yeah I had a little practice this is a hell of a story to tell you in five minutes. The short version is in the UK, um, we have been behind with everything. Our theatres are closed, having not only just opened some of them a bit. Um, our funding has come very, very late and missed out most creative people and we're having a horrible time. Um, what I did do to tell the story in slightly more detail is a timeline of, uh, of what has happened. So I'll try and go through that really quickly. Um, on the 16th of March, Boris Johnson, our Prime Minister, told the public, you should avoid theatres. This was a disaster for theatres because we hadn't been told to close. So there was no financial compensation for people not coming, you were, you were just told that the public shouldn't come. So the guy who runs our association of theatre, Julian Bird, who runs Salt UK Theatre, um, fought very hard and very quickly to get the government to tell theatres to close. And that created an attitude I think is still with us. We've been very slow to reopen, slower than almost anybody I know about. I'm looking forward to hearing everyone else's stories. Um, at the same time, uh, our Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak, the guy who does the money, um, announced two schemes, furlough, which is paying employed people to not work so they can keep their jobs, and S-E-I-S-S, which is for self-employed people. Now, I think the British theatre, more than anywhere, or British performing arts, is um, very focused on self-employed people. So only 30% only of people in theatre actually have jobs, and they're mainly financial directors or janitors or people that look after things and pretty much almost all the creative people are self-employed we work in lots of different places we don't have a job so when theatres shut we lose all our contracts and we don't have any money and it is absolutely horrible now of the 200 thousand people in that situation one third still haven't had any support i quickly became part of two um really quite hard hitting organizations freelancers make theater work campaigning for theater people and we shall not be removed campaigning for those of us who are also disabled to be remembered in the cultural recovery because particularly severely disabled artists get left behind really badly 
Um, the next date in my timeline was the 20th of June, which is a weirdly meaningless date, 26th of June, where Oliver Dowden, who's our Minister for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, announced a five-point plan for reopening theatre. Um, and the stages were first, distanced rehearsal and training, second, performances for broadcast as well, third, adding on outdoor performance and pilots for reopening which I did one at fourth performances inside and outside with social distancing and fifth uh, performances inside and outside with fuller audiences um, keep that in your heads while I tell you other information on the 5th of July so that's five months after we locked down the cultural recovery fund was announced up to that point there'd be no government support for theatres. Um, the funding situation in Britain is very complicated because it goes through four different nations. So the central government announces 1.57 million. This is divided between England, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. And only in England does the UK government control how this is spent. Um, this gets very, very complicated. But to cut a long story short, there was good help for freelance artists in Scotland and Wales, no help in England or um, Northern Ireland. And in England, the funding was very much restricted to looking after brands, paying for buildings to survive and nothing for artists. Um, then next in the timeline 10th of july we moved to stage three we moved there all the first three stages actually so rehearsal training you can do that for performances and broadcast outdoor performances and pilots 26th of july i did one of the two pilots for theater the other being um andrew lloyd weber and um we were very very contrasting i think ours was tiny and it was the only one for opera one person doing um, the smallest possible opera you could do because that's my company specializes in the small scale. Um, that was fantastically useful for us and a very happy event actually. We had very good feedback from our audience. I think that's because we did two meter social distancing and I think Andrew Lloyd Webber who did a concert with Beverly Knight in the London Palladium had one meter social distancing and a rather unhappy audience. Anyway, um, then we were told we could reopen on the 1st of August, then we were told we couldn't reopen on the 1st of August, then we were told on the 31st of July we could move to stage four, that's socially distanced performances, from the 15th of August. Um, though it's at this moment that the opening changes in our four nations, so I'm not sure Scotland, somebody can correct me, I'm not sure Scotland has ever reopened. Um, but um, certainly it's, it, at that moment it became different in each of the four nations. Um, Theatres do get going. I ran a festival three weeks after that, which Sarah, you were in actually, there you are, yeah, um, which had um, 18 different live performances in a very small theatre. It was very difficult, but also very creative actually, and very successful at the same time. Everybody had to change what they were doing. Um, very few other theatres got going. The Bridge Theatre, Nicholas Heitner's, did a lot of monologues. Then, just as our bigger institutions, like our National Theatre or the Royal Opera, were beginning to do tiny things, um, the uh, locked, second lockdown happened. So, um, Boris announced that on the 31st of October, closing us from the 5th of November, November till the 2nd of December. Whether that um, changes or not I don't know but uh, back to my summary so we've hardly done anything we've shut again and all the artists are having a horrible time but there's quite a lot of money being thrown uh, at the buildings I was speaking and I wasn't yeah <laughs> I just said thank you that was incredible um, in a nutshell <laughs> of what's been going on um, so shall we fly to Prague and Simona, mm -hmm. you want to take yes. Yes. designer and also um, Oystat, um, head of Oystat Costume Subcommission. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hello, everybody. And thank you, Mayu, for organizing this session because I think it's very important in these difficult days to share the information we have. 
So I will try to do a little brief of what's going on in my country, Czech Republic. I'm based in Prague. So since March 15, we had lockdown, which means immediate stop of activities for actors, musicians, singers, and all connecting professions. At the moment, all these people start to make uh, face masks at homes, in costume shops, in theater, and big wave of solidarity and positive energy in whole community was enormous in the spring. All these activities shows our positive attitude compared to the government, which was not well prepared, made a non-consistent decision and fumbled. So my personal situation as a costume designer for illustration was my first production in the year uh, was drama for open air stage. Premiere is postponed one year. Second uh, project was opera postponed indefinitely. And third was Outreal Dance Performance, which was moved from April to September, where we did the premiere, three shows, and since then, theater is closed again. Uh, I'm also a costume designer for film and TV, so I can say that many films doesn't start shooting at all, TV a bit, but at the moment, big increase of COVID positive in the crews make many projects stop again. There is a Netflix and Amazon project in Prague, but they have very strict rules and every two days testing. And I heard just yesterday that the biggest Amazon project which is doing in my country was uh, shut down just yesterday. From half of May, uh, we had gradually slackening of restriction, but still with face mask. June, July, August, uh, in some theaters continue rehearsal with any restrictions. And during September, there were a lot of postponed premieres happen. Summer open stage uh, stages was working with 50% of the audience and the biggest, bigger production was limited under 500. Uh, number of infected people after summer was growing up and with relieving in theaters and in shooting a lot of COVID positive actors and artists was a rise as well. The government didn't react for this high number and for warning of specialists till beginning of December, where was the election in my country. And due this, we are in worse situation than in spring and big restriction was established again. So all culture events are closed again with some uh, exceptions. So we can do rehearsal in theaters with security measures. Singing more than five people inside is not possible. So no opera, no musical, no concerts, choir, and so on. Many concerts and performances are streamed without audience. And there is um, some new established agencies in my country who mediated an online streaming. For example, there is one new one which offer for 12 euro per month, uh, streaming of wide range of performances from TV archive and also the new stream uh, projects. Uh, what is <laughs> strange in my country that especially during the summer, cinema and theater performance from car start to be very popular in my country, which was not before. Uh, there is usually the cinema, but there was also many theater performance mostly like uh, new circles and some of them. Uh, general theater will be probably not open till Christmas, maybe in January, but probably in um, August, um, February. And for some of the culture segment, this situation is completely liquidating. Uh, about some state support, I can say that part of the artist was support in May with 1000 euro. In June, 760 euro. At the moment, there is in a process program for supporting all freelance artists and professions in performing arts uh, like 20 euro per day or some flat rate 2,400 euro till end of the year. Then we will see. Uh, there, were, there, there were allocated 36 million euro for culture projects, which were not possible to be happened by Minister of Culture. Is not much but it's something but in the first round there was only six million euro round out from that program because uh, a bad and not clear conditions second round is still open uh, we have a department of arts management in theater academy damu together with school of economics in prague and with theater institute they did independent mapping mapping of impact covid 19 to scenic and creative arts 
It is part of wider research about economical and production impact to actual crisis in connection with COVID pandemic. Czech International Theatre Institutes as an umbrella organization for Czech scenic art are working on many materials which might, which might help Minister of Culture to understand the need of culture segment. But as probably as in many other countries, the politics doesn't see culture as a priority. And besides this, uh, Czech president say in publicly that we as artists are people who is doing only free time activities and only the strongest might have the right to survive. So uh, there is not big hope our political authorities will accept the culture as an important segment of our lives, but we try to do our best and we hope. Thanks. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, speechless. Move on to Nikos Hadzopoulos in Athens. If you can unmute yourself, and <laughs> direct the theatrical translator, amazing talent, and you know, I'm not going to say anything else. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, things here in Greece are very complex. Mayu knows about this very well. And uh, I think, I'm not sure that five minute time will let me uh, speak all, about all the parameters of, the, of this situation. Anyway, I try to read in order not to, in order to gain some more time. In order to describe the current situation in Greek theater, I have to step some decades back because you know, the coronavirus disaster is not the only one that has fallen upon us. During the last 40 years, we have seen a tremendous multiplication of drama schools and workshops of every kind. From five in 1980, today we have more than 30, only in Athens area. Only two of them are state schools, all the rest are private. And they are not considered as educational institutions, but as financial enterprises, which of course, in a free market system, we cannot control, but we have to help them flourish. This had as a result five or six hundred of new actors coming out of them every year, claiming their share in an already limited theatre market, and of course about 90% of them are usually led to unemployment. Since 2010, Greece suffers a severe financial crisis. As a consequence, all collective bargains and agreements are abolished. No more minimum salaries, no more mandatory social security, no more union contracts. But schools and theaters were multiplied again. We can discuss this phenomenon later if there are time, if there's time. Today, there are about 150 theater venues only in Athens. Most of them have a capacity between 100 to 300 seats and they present about 1,500 productions per year. All this theatrically busy environment was built on expense of the actors, especially the younger ones have nearly accepted today that they don't sign contracts, that their rehearsal time is not going to be paid, that they are not going to have a social security enough to secure them a retirement pension in the end of their career, etc instances of abuse, of non-declared occupation, of no payment at all, are very common. Briefly speaking, being an actor in Greece today is not a profession you can live, you can earn your living with. It is mostly a hobby. On top of this already all toxic situation, there came the coronavirus pandemic. Theaters closed in spring and the Athens festival was canceled. But the numerous companies that were in the middle of their rehearsals were not remunerated because they had no contracts. In summertime, since tourism is Greece's main industry, the country opened the borders, letting poorly controlled infected people in. Open air theaters were permitted to work in 50% of their capacity, but lacking the central guidelines from the government, and with an uncertain strategy, one by one, the local authorities canceled their festivals, which festivals are the main venues for touring theater companies. 
Again, no remuneration for the counseling. After a period of no guidelines at all about how cultural venues should function in winter time, indoor theaters were finally allowed in October in 30% of their capacity and with a strict hygienic protocol. The result, many theaters could not suffer this financial restriction and did not open at all. And after three weeks, although the protocols were strictly observed and theaters appeared as the safest public places in function, they were the first to get closed again in fear of the second pandemic wave. And you understand, unemployment mounts now near 99%. Again, there are no remunerations and artists are beginning to literally famish. What was made clear from all the situation and was, has caused many anger between the, the, the artists community is that no Greek government till now was aware of the above humiliating conditions in theater and had not culture among the priori priorities. On the contrary, whenever they wanted to show that they were taking measures, the easiest way was to close the cultural venues because taking other kinds of measures would put them in a heavier political risk. We can also discuss that uh, further later. They still don't see that modern culture in Greece is potentially a big industry. And the final blow was given by the Prime Minister himself the other day, who identified cultural events with uncontrolled amusement in bars and clubs. So they had to close. One positive outcome, though, of this situation is that the art workers of all kinds have gathered more around their unions and gave them a more reliable voice. So for the time being, unions are stronger and try to organize their next steps. I hope that this togetherness will last because I'm afraid doing things together is not a very strong point in Greek mentality. <laughs> That's all for the moment, for the five minutes I had. Thank you, see you later. Thank you so much. Um, okay, moving to France and uh, John, an amazing opera director and film in opera, excitedly director. John, are you there? Where is he? Okay. Ah, hello. Hello. <clears throat> yes, uh, I live in France, so a disclaimer here, but I don't work here very much. So I have uh, a very little experience of the COVID pandemic in France. I've certainly talked to colleagues and friends um, about, uh, about the situation, but it's not first-hand. I do have a fair idea about this current state of play. However, um, I think it'd be useful to consider the context of the French uh, cultural system, particularly in relation to what Bill said, um, because freelance theatre workers here are considered salaried, even though they're freelance which means they enjoy the same protections as salaried employees and are already, they already get subsistence between contracts. It's a complex system. But basically, if you work for three, 500 hours or so per year in France or elsewhere within the EU, you qualify for a status called intermittent, which is intermittent. And that entitles you to, depending on your earnings, between 250 euros and 600 euros per week between contracts. Um, this is subject to means testing, so the very highest earnings don't get all of it. But it, it, essentially what it means is that the French have already have a very supportive structure for people working in the performing and audiovisual arts. So compared to some previous speakers, the COVID arrival has a terrible effect on the industry as a whole, but individual artists didn't necessarily immediately find themselves in a, in a huge panic. When lockdown arrived, President Macron announced that all qualified intermittent workers would have their status extended. So the, the hourly um, top up that they need to have to keep the status would be extended for the, uh, in the uh, immediate time. And then in August, he renewed all of those for a whole year, which in effect means that everybody has a guaranteed income, not a huge income, but a guaranteed income until September 2021. Um, when France went into lockdown the first time, the government also announced a compensation scheme similar to furlough, 
which uh, was the equivalent of 80% for work cancelled um, by COVID. And anti-mutant workers, workers were entitled to this. <clears throat> some subsidised organisations were, <coughs> excuse me, uh, somehow exempt from this on the basis that their income came as much from public funds as box office earnings. And there was quite a lot of disagreement over that. Uh, as I understand it, um, since the summer, um, that has been somewhat uh, remedied and um, and artists can now, sorry, all theatre and performing arts workers can take out, take on contracts in the knowledge that they will get at least 80% of their contracted fees, even if the project is cancelled. Um, there is a ceiling on that so that no one can earn more than four and a half times the minimum wage, um, which is uh, 1,521 euros a month. Um, now that is 6,844 euros a month as a maximum, um, which is quite a lot. But if you imagine that some, some artists, particularly um, well-known opera singers and conductors, might earn that per night, and they also have bills and mortgages uh, accordingly, um, that has still caused a lot of problems for them. Um, nonetheless, I think it's fair to say that people working regularly in the performing and audiovisual arts sectors have not been forced to sell homes. Um, the public protocols have been much the same as elsewhere and the effect of having quite healthy subsidies in the arts means that some organisations could reasonably well cope performing to 50% houses when they, um, when they were allowed and I'm not aware of any that have gone bankrupt. Nonetheless, um, audience restrictions were removed during the summer, mostly driven by independent cinemas who felt they couldn't make, um, make the sums add up and provided everybody wore masks. Um, I don't suspect that those that that um, more relaxed approach will will be um, taken when we do get to reopen, but we'll have to see. As far as I can tell, there has not been a government ruling on safe working conditions on and off stage. This has led to quite a wide variety of practice where safety measures have appeared driven as much by the desire to avoid cancellations as by the responsibility to avoid artists and technicians catching the virus. During the first lockdown, there were there were more than a few reports of artists being asked to ignore common guidance given to the general public in the name of not making directors reimagine their work or and some people did indeed reject that i gather the growing understanding of the way the virus trans has transmitted um, has informed a greater respect for distancing and mark mask wearing however testing remains ad hoc and i i was chatting to somebody this morning actually who said uh, there may be a, a problem with the law in france actually forcing people to have tests um i've had looked at various protocols from different theatres and it, it's interesting to, to con compare them. Um, the, they, they, they range typically according to the, the size of, and scale of the theatre. So some have, most of them provide masks and gels, but they have different sets of rules and they're um, a fairly small project with you know, not, not much infrastructure. There are basically no rules at all. Um, and essentially the artists are imposing the rules um, up to one of the major opera houses which does a kind of movie style dividing of the, of the workforce with people wearing red badges if they are um, if they have to be in, in contact with each other so these are these are performers people on stage and in the wings in the immediate wings um, the people backstage who are wearing have, have an orange badge and then admin wear um, yellow badges and all of the people wearing orange and red bags have to have tests before they can come in. They have to have their temperature taken before they enter the theatre. Um, they have very, very strict protocols, but it, it, it's not enforced. So that's been left completely up to the, um, to the organisations to, um, to, to take care of, of artists. And now as we enter the, we've entered the second lockdown um, from a few weeks ago, there are no performances um, with audience, and t at least until the 1st of December. The government has said it will revisit the confinement rules every two weeks. Uh, despite that, this, the uh, theatres have had a chance to plan and the government's support of individual artists and cultural workers means that some, some productions are still in rehearsal um, on the off chance that they will get to open because people will get paid most of their income whether or not they do. I actually, and I know of four opera companies that are planning to stream their performances if they don't get to all to admit the public and they will still pay performances in full if they get to stream it. Uh, I'm less tuned into the straight theatre world, um, but there seems much less activity uh, during lockdown. The Comédie Française, for example, uh, is closed. It had one live stream uh, last week, but everything else um, planned for streaming 
was already planned before COVID. Um, so they don't seem to have changed their activity very much. There are some live concerts um, streamed on platforms such as Arte and Medici, but there's nothing like normal activity. And some of the organizations like in the UK and elsewhere are streaming their own concerts, but it's like one or two a week. So uh, there's not a great deal going on, but the French, I think it's fair to say, rather took the attitude that we do what we do or we don't do it. Perhaps because they didn't actually have to earn to earn money. And so uh, things had tended to just to be on or off. We've got three speakers from the US. Um, we've got uh, Ryan, who's currently in Philadelphia. Um, so I think he needs to jump in and jump out. Uh, and he'll tell us why. Um, uh, Irene in New Orleans and uh, Sarah, who's actually in the UK. Um, so shall we start with Brian? to tell us why he needs to jump in and out of the Zoom as well. Yeah, I can jump in. <laughs> so he's, he's um, in Philadelphia right now. He's the, the vice president and global outreach person for the Academy of Vocal Arts at uh, AVA in Philly. So they are, um, he's responsible. That's why he had to jump in and out. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties, but um, he's responsible for the whole virtual teaching pro, uh, you know, um, equipment that they have at AVA because um, as in other countries, well, very well mentioned before, one of the first things that got hurt was um, singing and the, 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 the live performance that has to do with uh, singing. Now here in, uh, I'm, I want, I can speak from New Orleans, I'm in Louisiana. Louisiana is going, and specifically New Orleans, is going now to phase three, which although they uh, allow, you know, uh, bars uh, to have people inside and social gatherings, not more than 150 people, again, they are forbidding live performances. So um, immediately after lockdown, um, we were supposed to, I was, I was being casted as uh, Pamina in the Magic Flute in the production here in New Orleans, and it was canceled. It was supposed to be last May, uh, then it was tra transferred to the fall, um, canceled again. Uh, then they were trying to uh, figure something out about using only local singers so that they don't have to bring in, um, el eliminate the traveling as much as they can. Uh, so they moved their entire, New Orleans Opera moved its entire season to spring and they um, uh, changed titles in order to have the fewer, fewer people on stage as possible. Um, I was offered a, a different part, which would be actually my debut in that role. So it was very exciting for me. But then a few weeks ago, even though it was scheduled for May 2021, we got a phone call from the artistic director saying that unfortunately they have to cancel the, perform the production as well because um, the New Orleans Opera collaborates with the Louisiana Philharmonic Orchestra and they are not doing live performances. They're not allowed to do live performances. So we have a nonprofit organization here in uh, New Orleans, me, my husband and two uh, other partners. We got hit very hard. We hardly make any, we don't make anything. It's a nonprofit. Uh, but we had to cancel the few events that we have every year. Um, we are, people would, would not come to live events. However, you know, churches every weekend are full of people. They're wearing masks, but I have seen and I have sung in weddings that there are 250 congregations with no masks whatsoever. So it's very, very... Um, non-balanced and unfair for the arts. We have a big festival here, uh, the Jazz Fest that happens every May. Uh, it was canceled last year and we, pro we, we project, I mean, we, we see that it's going to be canceled. This is a huge, huge income for the city of New Orleans. 
um, that will, so it will very much um, hurt from canceling that. Uh, we have a lot of friends here that are in live entertainment, like cover bands, and that are not allowed to play indoors or outdoors. Actually, the performance that I just um, mentioned that was canceled in May was projected to be outdoor with Mike and all this. Um, and still, they're not gonna they're not gonna do it. And um, another. Um, Another platform that I see that got uh, very hurt. Uh, I am also a teacher at Loyola University here in New Orleans, and uh, we are not allowed to see our students. Our students, although they are on campus, they have some lessons that are high flex, which means they have to be social distant, you know, with wearing mask, nothing to do with singing, whether it's chorus or individual private lessons, no matter how far you are, you're not allowed to be next to, uh, in a same room with your student. You're not allowed to have a collaborative pianist uh, playing with, with you, even with distance. We are using um, the faculty's studios as what they call Zoom pods. So they have equipped uh, every room with a computer and a Zoom and ethernet cable so that the connection is be as, as stable as possible. And uh, we just see our students virtually every week, which uh, also is the, one of the uh, main reasons for a lot of anxiety in young singers, a lot of anxiety in actually graduates that were planning to go on summer festivals that are canceled. Um, but uh, we all had to adapt in new technology. We all had to adapt to see what can we do so that the sound, everybody had to, 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 to uh, buy new microphones, external microphones, use some programs, get familiarized with some new programs that will eliminate the delay between, you know, if you have to um, work with a coach uh, virtually. Uh, students have to have their coach pre-record their accompaniment, so they have to sing such a tricky and very intuitive art as opera or classical singing uh, with the recorded on the recorded accompaniment. So it eliminates the freedom that they have to pause or so that that has a huge effect in young artists' uh, psychology. And uh, although we are now on phase three, uh, the university announced that even uh, in the spring semester, we're still going virtual. We're not, we're not in person anymore. So I really hope that for the sake of the arts, everything will be much better soon. Yep, absolutely. And um, Brian, do you, are you connected? Yes. Yet? It was working great, and then when it was my turn, it wasn't working at all. So I'll be really, really brief. Um, uh, but thank you for bringing all these artistic minds together, because the political minds that we have making these decisions don't understand. Um, what Irini just said about the fact that you can't go to a musical um, thing, but yet you can get on the airplane to go to the musical thing is completely hypocritical. Uh, it's only because these big airlines and other industries have lobbyists there pounding the doors of government to open up um, and unfortunately we them music food hotels all those things and it's just it's just dying quite frankly um, I do have kind of I have one foot in a more like academic um, institutional uh, world and then once in the performing world um, as Irini said there are great technologies out there things like sound jack um, which is a German program, um, soundjack.eu, where you, you, you tether in with your ethernet, you get a USB mic, and I was in Zurich a little while ago, and someone was in Philadelphia, and we were able to perform, at, well, perform, to rehearse, at least, in real time with very little latency. So um, hopefully we can have, like, a Facebook group or something where we can post things with all of us together. I think that would be really mutually beneficial. Um, 
a silver lining of this, I would say, is that uh, because as many, uh, one more thing about the U.S. before I go on to that, uh, just in case anybody's not familiar, the U.S. is not state subsidized like most of Europe is, right? All of our um, opera companies and symphonies are, are supported by private donations, either corporations, um, you know, board members and such. Um, that has been tough because all those people, uh, when the when the um, stock market went down, all of their money, no matter how much or how little they had in it, went down. So the checks that they're able to write this year are much smaller um, than what they're used to. Um, the, the, the tricky situation is the people making the decisions about whether or not the opera companies, whether or not we're going to open or not, they're not the ones, they may have taken a pay cut, but they're not the ones getting no money whatsoever. If you look at the Metropolitan Opera, they have laid off a lot of people, but they furloughed their chorus, their stagehands, um, their orchestra uh, with nothing except their health benefits through, I think, the end of 2020. Um, but the people making the decisions on whether or not they're going to reopen, they still have their jobs. They're not in danger of losing their jobs for the most part. So it's really unfair that the people making those decisions are still largely unaffected um, by this. Um, yes, if a, if a, if a governor or, a, or mayor in a city says you can't have live or no more than 400 or 500 or even 50 people, then no matter what the opera company says, but if the, if the local government opens it up and then the opera and symphonies decide not to open, well, the, the musicians are left, are left out with, with nothing. Um, under Trump, uh, he cut all of the funding of the National Endowment of the Arts, the Humanities, the Sciences. It wasn't a huge portion of um, American um, uh, arts funding, but it was, well, it was the little that we had, and it's all now gone. Um, so, yes, things are dire. Uh, here, everything has been canceled at least till the end of 2020, the rest of the Met season to 2021. We're crossing our fingers for things in the summer, like Santa Fe uh, and other festivals. Um, I was happy to, well, not happy, but glad to be informed with what Bill was saying about things in the UK, because after, you know, I have no job until May when I'm supposed to go to London to do Faust, and there's very little chance that sounding it sounds like that's very little chance that that's actually going to happen uh one good thing i can say about the american government is that um they did offer um, what's called ppp loans so payroll protection loans which uh irini and i were able to qualify for which was forgiven um it wasn't a lot but it was two and a half months worth of what we would normally make they did offer another kind of called economic disaster loan which is a loan that you have one year before you start paying it it's based on a percentage of your income and the rate is really low uh, by US standards. Um, so there are options from the government, uh, kind of splitting the difference between what it sounded like was happening in France and what is happening um, uh, in the UK. But the silver lining I wanted to say before I hop off is that I was able to go to Zurich because the opera company, the opera world plans things many years in advance. And we had a, perform, a, a production done uh, scheduled for the summer. Um, that was canceled, and then we were going to do it in September again as a remount. Then it became a concert performance of that show. Then it became just Verdi concerts. Um, so we went there. We quarantined uh, for 10 days. We rehearsed socially distanced with masks, except when we were singing. And then we did five performances in the Zurich house, which we were told it was going to be sold at 50%. Um, it was actually sold at 80%, which was a little bit more... There was more people than I think most of us felt comfortable with, but that was not our decision. And I needed to make the money, quite frankly. Um, so I crossed my fingers and kept my mask on and, and, and used my hand sanitizer. Um, I can tell you that they were really successful. Um, Zurich is very um, liberal in their use of, I mean, people that were wearing masks in shops and on the trams, but on the street, they were not juxtaposed to Paris when I went there right after, everybody on the street had a mask, certainly everybody uh, in, in, in cars and in, indoors um, had masks. But I can say that although Europe has closed back down and Zurich has closed down and the opera houses in Germany and Zurich have, and, and, and Austria and Switzerland have closed down as well as Spain and Italy and France, um, it's, I can say at least in Zurich, there were no outbreaks there. People were taking it really seriously. And my point is that it is possible. In the audience, there were no reports of outbreaks from people who got it there. 
I then was able to pick up um, uh, a concert, again, a Verity um, concerts in Dallas Symphony Orchestra, which is one of the only places that's open here. Now they have an 1800 seat house and they only sold 200 tickets. But they had a very generous donor who underwrote the whole thing. Everyone was COVID tested every morning, which after six or seven days in a row gets to not feel so great. But again, if that's what I need to do in order to make money and provide for my family, I will, I will do it. Um, they're selling that, they, they taped them um, and they're selling, you know, for $20 or whatever the, the cost is, you get the link and then you can watch um, that show along with their whole season. Um, and you can buy a season pass if you like. Um, as many times as you like between now and May. So there are innovative people, brains like that are on this call right now that can figure out ways to responsibly get us back um, to work and performing. Um, I think we just need the, the, the pipeline or to get the ear of the government people who are making the decisions, be it on the local, uh, national or EU level um, to, to really do this. And I, I just, I just, you know, I'm, I've, I've been depressed, I felt better, I was depressed again, I'm hopeful, but now with the winter coming and everyone not sure what's gonna happen, I just, I just don't know, but I don't, we have two options, to sit on the couch and say, well, this sucks, I don't know what to do, or we can be like, I'm gonna try, I'm tired of sitting on the couch after seven months and watching Netflix. I need to try to do something, you know, and I know we're all in the same spot, I know that we are, um, and I just, I'm, I'm so thankful, Mayu, for you, for bringing us all together, multinational, all over the world, great minds who are going to come up with solutions. Um, and I can't wait to be a part of the next two. I'm sorry that I have to go to this meeting that I cannot move um, to miss the rest of this conversation, but or to Irini, Phil, and me uh, later on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I mean, hopefully, I'm trying to record it. So, you might be able to watch the rest of it. Um, so um, hopefully. If that's Great. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, thank you so, so much. That was- Thank you all. Helpful and inspiring as well. Um, uh, jumping into Luxembourg with um, Larissa. Are you Hello. Hi. Yes. Hi. Hi, Mayu. Thank you very much. Yes, um, I'm an, an actor and writer from Luxembourg of Romanian origin. Um, Luxembourg is um, a bit particular in that it's a very small territory and it's quite well off. So it's easier to manage. And um, the government has been rolling out free nationwide testing, for instance, si since March, um, as well as providing free masks um, during the first lockdown. And this has also now extended to theatres. When theatres reopened um, in September, most venues provide free testing to um, all the freelance artists working with them, uh, weekly testing. So um, there is a, a general feeling, at least for someone who is part of the at-risk group, that there is some consistency, um, clarity uh, about the pandemic in general. And because for instance, mask wearing was, well, pretty much mandatory from the beginning in, on public transport, for instance, or um, in, uh, in, in public places, there's very little of um, sort of the conversations that you see now increasingly popping up in Germany, for instance. Um, so that provides for a general sense of safety. Um, then Luxembourg is at this moment a, a kind of a, um, a little island apart from its huge neighboring countries, Germany, France and Belgium. Um, they're all under lockdown again and venues are closed but in Luxembourg we're not under lockdown and venues are operating so theatres are open, I'll be with social distancing with very reduced capacity to meet the distance and the audience has to wear masks during um, the performance. But people are rehearsing and performing and um, there are people attending theatres. Uh, so, so this is sort of in terms of practicality um, where we're at. Then in, in terms of the funding, Luxembourg also benefits from uh, state subsidies. And again, just <laughs> it being so small, if you if you've worked here for a, for a, a while, you kind of 
after a while you already, I guess you kind of know everyone and that includes decision makers. Um, we're very lucky that this, at this moment in time, we have a Minister for Culture who's extremely open and she's very dedicated um, to the arts. So they've announced measures both for freelance artists and for venues, uh, well, pretty much from the, from the beginning. There is a similar system in Luxembourg as the one mentioned by John in France, Intermittence, uh, and that was extended until um, August. There were like just special measures for people who have theaters. And then in September, theaters opened up again and work kind of started again. Now, beyond sort of these practical um, considerations, there were two thoughts that I wanted to share with you about, well, first of all, venues and then um, uh, new storytelling forms, because a lot is um, sort of made about that and people talk about that quite a lot. And I think that Luxembourg there again is, is in quite a particular situation. And that is mainly because it's a very, very young scene. So it's not really comparable with the other um, European countries surrounding it. So it's really only on, in the last couple of decades that the scene has grown and become more professional, that venues have been built and people employed to run them. And so this might explain why actually uh, there is a very, how should I put it, like strong connection to venues. So the focus is actually on reopening venues or how to run venues to go back into venues for people to attend just the physical buildings. And there isn't really a, a fringe scene, so to speak, of, I mean, nothing comparable to, to the UK, for instance. Everyone sort of works with a venue, with some exceptions, but most of them. Um, and this is kind of perhaps also translated into this conversation on form, although, there have been some attempts, attempts during the summer to uh, use digital medium to kind of connect with audiences. There, there is a general sense also from artists that they do want to sort of work as they used to before. Um, and so most of the conversation has actually been been driven by venues and they are there is a solidarity between them so for instance you have the large spaces sharing their stages with the smaller venues and that's a kind of a win-win for both of them because the smaller theaters couldn't have reopened um they couldn't have implemented social distancing and the large venues they usually run on european co-productions or buying in productions and now obviously that that flow has been interrupted. So um, they benefit from it as well because they have productions that were sort of ready to go um, on, their, on their stages. And it has helped sort of people who were employed or who were um, scheduled to work keep their employment. But also it's sort of, I guess, um, focused the attention on people who make work locally um, which is relevant to Luxembourg just again because you're surrounded by these big <laughs> countries with such rich theatrical histories, uh, Germany, France, Belgium, and then there is like little Luxembourg in between. So there's always sort of been this struggle between um, we have great, we have people here, but at the same time we are very small and we want to collaborate with everyone. So now this is just been cut short and you sort of have to look at well who's actually there and who's making work here what kind of stories are they telling and um, are they relevant and, and so on so in that sense I think it could be very interesting um, generally for our little local scene to sort of have a really hard look at ourselves how we produce why and and um, and with whom Great. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Larissa. We have uh, three people from Sweden, from Baka Theatre. Uh, so we've got Eleutherio, who's an actor, Lisa, producer, and Rasmus, who's an actor and director. And they just opened, well, just a few days ago, opened The Nation um, in Sweden. 
and I'm, as far as I'm aware, they're still playing. So um, I don't know how you want to do it, if you want to go one at a time or if you want to um, uh, be all three unmuted. It's up to you guys. Yeah, uh, hi everybody. Um, we had a little meeting in the morning and we decided that I will start, then Lisa will talk and at the end will be Rasmus. Um, yes, of course. Hi everyone from Sweden and Gothenburg. Um, yeah, it seems like um, everything <laughs> kind of sucks a little bit here. Uh, but hopefully, I think those kind of meetings, those kind of uh, open dialogues, uh, those kind of gatherings is a hope in the tunnel, is a light in the tunnel. Unfortunately, our soul, the nation, is now, uh, we are not planning, we are going to start playing again 19th of November because of the um, new regulars that the government we decided not to play this mom at this moment, but we will start again. Nothing <laughs> stops here in Sweden. Well, I will uh, talk a little bit. I will. I will talk a little bit my experience now because I'm an immigrant that I left my country Greece before uh, eight years ago, and I went to another country to start working as an actress, which is like impossible. But yes, nothing is impossible if you believe it. Uh, well, it was 8th of March this year. We were working in Baca Theater, a barn production, a child children production, which is called The Color of Out Space, um, an adapted a novel from uh, LHB Lovecraft. And it was, uh, I think, one o'clock when Erika, uh, our uh, colleague, uh, she came inside the theater running, 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 and I said, Stop! Now, everybody must leave the building because we have found a corona a person and now. And it was like very shaking this moment. It was a big shock. What is this? This is like a tragedy now, a person coming inside and telling this, no, it, no, no. So I went up to my camera and I pick up my things and uh, went home and just sitting and said, what? is this now I, we are not going to play no we are not going to play and this is we we decided not to play we decided to to close the theater for um from mars and open again no, in october but uh, uh thanks to sweden and thanks to this uh, lovely country and uh, um the theater decided that okay you should do something else now, Eleftheria, or some other actors. Like, for example, I have a problem with my Swedish. I'm not a uh, Swedish actress. So the theater decided to educate me in my, with voices uh, and with, um, to find me a teacher that I can go and uh, be better in that. And it, that it was a big, big, big surprise for me because it's open and it, it opens in the world. I start thinking, okay, now, now it will be great when I will go back on stage and I will not have this sound of, uh, um, yeah. And then uh, I did everything this period, I have to say. Yoga, meditation, uh, springing out 10 kilometers uh, every day, um, watching a lot of performances via Zoom, via live streaming talking with a lot of friends around Europe about the situation, how we are going to manage, how, what is going to happen. But at the end, when, um, when, uh, when I'm sitting alone, I'm thinking uh, that, that the most important thing right now is to find a way to be together. Uh, and wh what I mean by that, I mean that Everything that I can do here by home, by this internet, it's, 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 it can develop my skills as an actor. But the most important thing is to find, again, a way to be together, even when it comes with distance. Because it's, it's in the human being, 
at find ways to be um, uh, to be to reform to empower uh, yeah and to find new opportunities to find new opportunities to go forward uh, I don't know. I, I, I would like. I, I, I'm not going to talk a lot because Lisa is the most expert here that uh, she can explain everything. But um, I can say also this period, these six months before we start rehearsing again, we start uh, rehearsing on July, the end of July, the Nations, and it was like five five hours performance, not uh, not like one hour. Uh, it was beautiful when I came back to stage. It was very, very beautiful. But uh, even though that we had the everyday routines, like um, someone in the morning used to say, "Now, please do not forget to hold, to 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 keep distance, to be two meters." Uh, it it was it was a little bit difficult because we are actors. We work physicals. We 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 have a body that needs to express and this body also it, it it was difficult but we made it we came up to the premiere uh, yeah uh, what else we did this period uh, the theater support us a lot i must to say we didn't uh, uh, we just we, we have we are with contracts now everyone and uh, we are working even though that we are not rehearsing, we are just um, uh, meeting each other via Zoom and we are reading plays, we are uh, uh, adapted uh, new plays, uh, uh, we, are we are making song lessons. Uh, so we are trying to find a way to be together. And that is the most important thing at the moment. And I think that the artists always find a way to create and to make art. And that's something that that's something that I really love about being an actress and to be a performer, the expression and uh, the new way of trying of trying to find the key. What is going to happen now? What is going to happen now? Uh, well, I, I I won't say more. Um, uh, I think a little bit of uh, some friends that they make a performance uh, here. They start working in Athens with a play of uh, Christina Uzunidis, but they didn't make it. But at the end, they make it to make this performance uh, through internet, through Zoom. And uh, it was like a, a, a practice of activism. And I think um, uh, that it was like a very, very beautiful moment in this uh, dark period uh, of uh, we don't know what is going to happen. But to, to, to have and to be a little bit activist in this period, I think it's, it's, it is a very important thing. Um, and yes, try to be kind with each other. We are fighting the same way. Oh. No. <laughs> Thank you. Lisa, do you, are you following up? Yes. Yes, hi. Hi, everyone, and thank you for inviting us. Okay, so I will continue. Thank you, Eleftheria. We are working in the same theater, which is uh, called Bakke Theater. Uh, it's a part of the city theater in Gothenburg, the, the um, second largest city in, Goth in Sweden. And we are working, we are a theater uh, for younger audiences and young adults. So we'll try to explain or talking a bit about my interpretation of the Swedish strategy, since I know that it's, it's been questioned and it's been discussed and it's uh, really discussed in Sweden as well. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of a, a picture of, of how, how I, I see it. Okay, so the strategy is the same as in, in, in most other countries or in other countries to slow the virus down, to make sure that the hospital, uh, hospitals have the capacity to cure the people and to protect the elderly. So we are not bound by law, but by recommendations. And the recommendations are made by experts and we are, uh, and the focus and the res responsibility is more on the individual so on me as a person and not by law or 
uh, anything else. So, um, so we are a country, we, we have a really high trust on our office holders, maybe more than the politicians. So I think that's the reason that we have the recommendations and the recommendations should be seen as really rules or law, but are just recommendations. So it's voluntary. So in the springtime, we, we didn't close the country down as in many other countries. We had the restaurants open. We had the, um, uh, we, didn't, we didn't close it down, but the theaters closed voluntarily, voluntarily down. Almost all theaters closed. And I would say that's one of the things that is problematic is that you, um, you have, since it's on your responsibility or voluntarily, uh, it feels like it's a responsibility to close it down to, uh, to, to keep the virus spread down. Um, and we closed, we closed the, the, the theater down for two weeks in the spring times and then we started to we didn't have any performances during the spring at all, but we could uh, slowly start to see each other again after one month or so. so. Uh, and, and now in the end of July, we open to rehearsals again. And we had, um, I would say also in springtime, we, we had the, the recommendations really steady for, for, for the whole time. We are not allowed to have um, parties or, or groups more than 50 people uh, and that's uh, that's for theaters that's for sports outdoors indoors uh, but doesn't uh, include restaurants it doesn't include malls it doesn't include uh, you could fly uh, in a full airplane so uh, we now have uh, we, we we came into the the autumn to discuss if we are going to, to do this performance, which is a really large performance. And we decided to, to try to do it. Uh, and with, we had understudies, we have uh, people who are every day reminding everyone of keeping a distance. We are really, the, the rules are the same as everywhere else. Wash your hands, stay at home if you are sick and, and, and keep your distance. And the the spread of the virus virus was also very low in the uh, August September October. So we made it to the opening, and then the 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 rules change. With there were a lot of discussions to increase it to uh, 300 persons, if you could keep the distance as a, as a maximum of 300 persons, if you could keep a distance with one meter. Uh, from each other. So for we have a really big hangar where we are playing, but still we could we could have 65 persons in our in our seats instead of 50. We were really really happy about that to be able to to invite more people. And then uh, unfortunately there were new recommendations, local recommendations. Now we are allowed to perform for 50 persons. But since this is now the, the recommendations from the, the government and the experts are not to go and see any shows. So we are not close, but the recommendations is as an as a, as a, um, uh, audience or as a, a, a member of society, don't go and see any shows. It's a really hard um, decision to make. And we have made the decision, we, decision to keep it open, but now in this uh, two weeks, we are closed to uh, rehearse some of the scenes again to see that we are really keeping distance. We are not so worried about the audience because we have been, um, we have been uh, doing and talking about this and, and uh, uh, have really, really, uh, a thorough rules of how the, they are seated and how they are, will come to the theater and everything and they are just 50 people but to make sure of the, the members of the of the, the performance that they are safe so uh, I would say also in the for the culture um, sector in Sweden of course they are bleeding and people are unemployed and it's a really hard time 
we as uh, as backup theater we are an institution we are very privileged so we can't compare ourselves with with other independent groups which is having a really really hard time um we had a meeting with the minister of culture and culture who was visiting us because she she was around and meeting represents from uh theaters and they have made a lot of crisis money for 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 the sector but of course not enough um and it's uh, the the big discussion has been why could you fly with a big airplane or go to the mall or you could have a sit at a restaurant with 300 500 people but if someone stands up and and sings a song it's a concert and then everyone else but the 50 people has to go out of the the, the, the house or the venue um it's a hard it's it's really hard discussions and, and decisions to make but also i mean this was now we are in a in a state of where the virus is, is spreading a lot in in big parts of sweden so hard for me now to, to to say that it's it's a hard time now uh but uh, i think the the discussions for us and for me is that uh are we is it a responsibility to close the theater for us as a theater even though we are allowed to play it or uh should we should we have it opened can we open again and will the audience show up in the springtime and uh, also a big discussion at the theater i would say is what 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 will be the meaning and the purpose of the theater and arts in this soon to be a post-pandemic world uh, i'm really happy about the news today that the, there is a vaccine on its way so uh, what would be the 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 art what could the art mean in the springtime when the, the pandemic is gone? And what will also this new uh, ways of meeting and the context we have now with these countries like this meeting, for instance, what could it mean and what could be uh, developed for kind of art? Wow. Okay. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, hello, Rasmus. Hey, hello. Uh, yeah, I want to begin to apologize for my perspective. It's more personal than my day-to-day -day reflections over working in a theater. But uh, maybe you need that also. Uh, uh, thank you for the invitation and uh, uh, thank you for listening to all of you. We do it with solidarity and uh, curiosity and uh, solidarity, of course. And uh, uh, we were talking about togetherness and you can also worry together. Uh, despite the uh, inspiring uh, talk, uh, I must admit that uh, one of my reflex is to hide or maybe have computer problems and uh, uh, just order a pizza and uh, watch some TV. And uh, uh, that is because of the fear, the laziness and the apathy. And maybe that's one of the biggest challenges that we have in front of us, the feeling of uh, powerlessness. Of course, we have economic and we have ideological and we have artistic and we have health uh, challenges. Of course, they are big and they are important. But the feeling of powerlessness, powerlessness is big. And we are all, as a creative people, uh, used to, to fight against uh, all these things in our artistic process. But the feeling of powerlessness is uh, difficult. I'm uh, really privileged in, in the way I'm, uh, I live in Sweden. I'm uh, permanently employed and uh, I work in a, a theater that don't have to depend on ticket sales. Uh, uh, but I also come from a country that are not so used to big, big crises like economic or, or war and all these things. And maybe uh, there's a risk, bigger risk to our country that we uh, let the powerlessness uh, and fear take over. At the Bucket Theater, uh, we are uh, getting our artistic self-confidence. Sometimes it's big, sometimes it's not so big at the meeting with, with the audience. The audience is really important for us. We are proud of that. 
that, but now that uh, contract with the audience uh, uh, to experience something in our uh, big black box uh, is under uh, pressure. And uh, as you heard uh, this spring, we, we try to see each other and learn each other and uh, grow together as a group and do something. And uh, then we tried to take that growing and uh, do a, a big show. But now the big show is uh, uh, on ice. And uh, we need the audience, the young people. Uh, most of them have their first cultural uh, uh, meeting in our theater. We need them to grow. And uh, we need the audience to exist. We have played for 50 people. It, it has been interesting. <laughs> but uh, also difficult, and now we play for zero. I, I like to, uh, I'm sure many of you have uh, re uh, read the text about, uh, that Nicholas Burgess uh, uh, wrote the 3rd April, and you can talk about it a lot. It was uh, the forgotten art of assembly. Uh, and many of the, uh, many things in that text I think is interesting and we should talk about it. Maybe not in this group, but we should. It's, uh, uh, that we have time to consider how we build a system that prepares people so when the next tragedy hits, we can work with that. Uh, he also say, lean into the pain, the mourn, and remind us that mourning is a human act, not a digital. Thank you. Amazing. Thanks so much, Rasmus. Um, and thank you, all three from Baca Theatre. Um, Back, jumping back to um, the United States, but via London. Um, so, Sarah, are you there? Okay. Um, so, full honest disclosure, I'm American, but I'm also a naturalized British citizen, and I've been living in the UK for 15 years. Um, I did spend half the year um, with my mom in Chicago, um, but wasn't doing any theater. Um, I only have one kind of recent experience, like personal experience of American theater. So a lot of this is things I've read and things I've heard anecdotally and what I've picked up. Um, and so if anyone wants to jump in or correct me, um, feel free, I won't be offended. Um, I'll speak more to theater, um, as we've already heard about the state of opera and live music to some degree. Um, and it's just an overview and, and some things I've kind of picked up on. Um, so kind of in terms of like the state of what's happening um, in the US, it's not hugely dissimilar to what's happening in the UK. If, if, if some of you I know are based in the UK and we've all heard Bill's very concise presentation. Um, it's, a, it's a mix of lots of different kind of mostly online experiments. Lots and lots of theaters are, um, and this is sort of a regional theaters and kind of new work theaters and mid-sized theaters are experimenting with things like radio plays, interactive performances, Zoom plays, um, short films, online developments, master classes, um, both as ways of giving artists platforms and developing artists and also trying to raise some revenue and a number of online festivals. And this is kind of across the country. Um, there hasn't been that much across the US in terms of live performance. And it's partly due to restrictions, although they vary greatly from kind of state to state because as we probably a lot of you have learned every state is really different um and it and usually you'll have more restrictive covid guidelines if you have a state that's run by a democrat than a republican who wants to kill you um, but that's just my feeling um there notably there's a really interesting um episode of the new york times podcast the daily from i think august where they talk about kind of the first um equity production of a live piece of performance which was done by the berkshire theater group and it was a, a production of godspell um but it's, it was distance and there were masks and there, there are a handful of um companies and festivals that have done some live work like for instance milwaukee rep is operating at 35% capacity for live shows, and they also have a streaming option. 
Personally, I think that's nuts because Wisconsin has one of the worst COVID rates in the country and people are dying at very high rates, but maybe that's just me. Um, New York City Ballet did a kind of experiment of some performances on the roof of a hotel in Midtown Manhattan. Kind of interesting, distanced, outdoors. Um, I know there's been some rogue um, comedy in the parks of New York City where people will gather and be distanced and wear masks and someone will bring an amp um, and a mic. Um, a lot of uh, companies that are still operating have pushed their, there's a sort of this idea, which is similar in the UK, there's a sort of pipeline backup of production. So you have um, a lot of the, the shows that would have been happening in this current 2021 season. Um, most theaters are, are doing their best to honor those companies and productions and pushing them forward to 21-22. Um, um, so it looks like there won't be like new, new productions until 2022, 2023. Um, they're, they're trying to, some of them are sort of, some people have just canceled this year altogether, but some companies have tried to respond to the moment and are rejigging a current season, mostly online, in order to incorporate more um, work by artists of color performed by and or performed by artists of color directed by artists of color to try to just be more ethical in response of the moment in response to an open letter um, that came out over the summer called we see you white American theater written by a group of um, artists of color because in the US um, the whole issue of COVID is so tied up with so many other things like the election and Black Lives Matter movement um, and some, what's really interesting to see is that some theaters are working towards more sustainable policies in terms of their, um, the way they treat their, their artists and, and working habits. And for instance, Center Stage, which is in Baltimore, um, is instituting policies around shorter working hours, a six, five day working week as opposed to a six day, eight hour tech day as opposed to a 12 hour tech day, paying writers to come into rehearsals, things like that. Um, the Oregon Shakespeare uh, Theater um, in Portland, which is a big, very important theater, is um, interested in trying to invest more in sustainable theater practices rather than just flying people around the country, partly because they've been hit so hard by the fires in, in um, the Pacific Northwest this, this summer. Uh, and their website said 75 people in their staff have their homes burned down. So there's a lot going on that's in the mix. Um, so it's not all bad, but it is <laughs> grim. There, there are some opportunities for, say, writers. I don't know if there's quite so much for company-driven work. There usually isn't in America or performers. Um, artists are, as, as, as Brian and Irini were talking about, on various kind of unemployment schemes depending on what state you're in and what you what you have access to there was the cares act coronavirus aid relief and economic security act that was passed in march that gave everyone a stimulus check and 600 um dollars a week which for some artists that was like far more than they were making before but unfortunately that um expired in august and the idiots in um, Congress and the Senate can't get their shit together to uh, pass another bill. So people are suffering while they screw around. Um, you can hear the anger in my voice. Um, it's hard for me not to see this politically. There is uh, a campaign called Be an Arts Hero. And there are unions and organizations and institutions who are campaigning um, and trying to lobby uh, Congress and the Senate to pass a kind of an arts relief bill in the way that bigger organizations like, you know, the, the airline lobby has been able to successfully do. I don't think it will pass, but maybe with Biden, maybe if we get the, the Senate in Georgia, who knows? Um, Broadway has come to a standstill, as a lot of people know. Um, their model, some say that their model has actually been hit harder than some of the mid-size and regional theaters because it's more commercial. And so no ticket sales, it's you know it's much harder um i've heard a lot of people complaining about a kind of lack of leadership coming from the commercial sector there isn't i mean say what you will about andrew lloyd weber but in the uk for instance people like andrew lloyd weber and sonia friedman have been trying to kind of experiment with socially distanced theaters and solutions and that doesn't seem to be happening in the in the um the, the broadway parallel um so broadway's closed till may um 
there, there are also a lot of theaters have been um, very focused on the election in the last few months and have been doing events to, to promote the Get Out the Vote organization. Um, and they also opened up their lobbies during lots of different various protests, Black Lives Matter protests, um, uh, for, for people to use their buildings. Um, as, as Brian and Irini were saying, there's no government funding. Um, the National Endowment for the Arts was completely clobbered by Trump, along with lots of other things. Um, but I guess in a way, because there's never been any government funding, theaters are just sort of scrambling as they have always scrambled because it's all making theater, making live performance in America is always a scramble. Um, I've read some interesting statistics around um, sort of advanced ticket sales and how that's buoying um, theaters up. The kind of lots of theaters run on a sort of uh, combination of like subscriptions sometimes, ticket sales, um, uh, fundraising, things like that. And it seems that the donations have gone down, but then they've gone back up again. And actually ticket sales for the 21, 22 season have been not so bad. Um, but in general, the state of live performance in America is extraordinarily precarious anyway. Um, but there, there, is, there is work happening, um, but I'm certainly not, not optimistic for live work in the US really frankly until there is a vaccine because to be honest even though i work in theater i make theater i've been hit pretty hard like a lot of other people i'm out of work i don't want to be responsible for killing anyone especially in a country like the us when the virus is already totally out of control in many many states um, but that's just my opinion um and that's that's about all i have thank you thank you very much and thank you to mayu for organizing this I'm quite worried that in New Zealand it's 5.30 in the morning um, and uh, Shannon Grant have been waiting patiently um, uh, in the middle of the night and thank you so much for waking up in the middle of the night for this. Um, a few days ago I posted through somebody else I'm sure in the reinventing page an amazing picture of Mary Poppins in New Zealand and everybody was like oh my god <laughs> uh, people are um, on the standing ovation in a theatre. Um, so we have two people from there, two very important people, uh, director at GNT Productions, uh, Grand Mies and uh, Sean Kloetz, who's an actor, actress um, in the musical. So I shall pass you. Yeah, um, good morning, everyone. Um, as you can see behind me, the sun is starting to come up. So that's a lovely little backdrop I've got um, happening. Um, I yeah, as, uh, just want to say thank you um, for everyone. Um, I am sitting in a really um, quite privileged area, I think, because in New Zealand, we have managed to put a hold, got a hold on the virus at the moment. And as um, Mayu said, yeah, I was um, lucky enough to play the part of Mary in Mary Poppins, um, which has just recently uh, closed over the um, over the last weekend, um, and yeah, we were able. We're in the really fortunate position that we were able to perform to a full theatre, um, and the feeling was surreal um, to be in the biggest global production um, that was happening at the at that time. Um, the our audience numbers was uh, 18, 18 to nineteen hundred, which is just um, unbelievable considering um, what's happening around the place um, but like you guys in March we know we did um, theatre was the first thing to be closed events and theatres in New Zealand was the first thing to um, just say no nope, close your doors and we kind of got about I'd say oh, I want to say a week's notice you know that Mary Poppins wasn't able to go ahead in our original in our original season um, and that was just what we had to do um, however we were lucky in the fact that our government did have a subsidy available for anyone in the um, like performing arts world and, and basically anyone that could prove that their income had um, had been lost either full-time or part-time so in New Zealand it is it's not very common that you are working full-time as an as an actor or in the um, musical theatre realm or performing performing arts realm. So we were able to have, um, yeah, we were able to, even if we were a contractor or, or something, we were able to apply for a subsidy because we were going into a four week 
at that stage, it was going to be a four week full country lockdown. Um, however, as we all know, events in theatre was not going to open at a level three, or, um, three, two, or it had to wait until the very end. So there was 12 weeks worth of a subsidy available. Um, and you could apply for that almost straight away and you were able to get that within 24 hours. Um, it wasn't, it was like minimum wage, um, but you know, everyone was able to make ends meet and everyone was able to um, get through that um, time. And as a country, we kind of just stuck together and we were able to um, map out, like stamp out the virus as it was. Um, Auckland, where I live and where um, Mary Poppins was um, put on, did go into a second lockdown, um, just as we were starting to rehearse Mary Poppins again. Um, so we uh, had to rehearse as a, um, at, via Zoom, which was interesting. And also then when uh, we were able to meet in bigger crowds, we were then rehearsing in masks and singing in masks, which <laughs> like you just, it was um, not ideal. Um, and then but again, at Auckland, we managed to get back to a level one stage, which means that theatres and large crowds can gather. Um, and we were able to get Mary Poppins on the stage and in front of an audience. Um, since Mary Poppins, we do, we are able, New Zealand is still in level one, and so we are able to perform. Um, there is other shows starting to open and, um, yeah, again, I'm performing this weekend and I just, it's in a, yeah, we're just in a really lucky position. Um, Australia, there's no one here from Australia, but in Australia are also starting to announce their shows and their, um, and ideally as New Zealand and Australia can start to get a bit of a bubble happening. Are we talking bubbles in New Zealand? It's, I'm not sure, I'm not too sure. It's, it's, uh, uh, so we have, um, we have bubbles of people and so ideally the plan is for us to have bubbles of, uh, of countries um, and with our Pacific um, neighbours as well. So um, at the moment, New Zealanders can travel to Australia without quarantining, but we just can't come home without quarantining. So it's still a bit of a risk to leave New Zealand um, because you can't get back in really easily without having a voucher and um, things like that. So at the moment, I'm staying put in New Zealand. <laughs> it's a, I'm able to sing, I'm able to perform. Um, it's, I'm able to be, yes, a, yeah, but as I say, I'm sitting in a really um, privileged position over here and um, yeah, just sending, you know, sending love to everybody out there who's not quite there yet. And I totally, um, I'm empathetic and I feel for you guys. Um, but yeah, being a part of Mary Poppins at that stage was just unbelievable and, and an absolute, yeah privilege and one of those people that made it happen is um, Grant who's going to be speaking now so it's over to him because his it was his risk taking and him and the, um, the rest of the production crew and their um, resilience and just get we get knocked down and we stand back back up again was um, able to just lead the cast and able to get us to where we were so Grant take it away. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks Sean. it would be fair to say we all know uh, the roller coaster ride <laughs> <laughs> in New Zealand and I'm sure everywhere else, but we do feel uh, very, very privileged. Um, so I'm part of uh, GNT Productions and uh, we were we we're very lucky to be, uh, I guess, have a production company that uh, we have a little bit of a, a, what they call a pro-am model in New Zealand. So it's a mix of um, professional and, and, and uh, community labour uh, that put these uh, shows together. Uh, musical theatre in New Zealand generally hasn't uh, uh, has been too expensive, I guess, a commodity to present because we're such a small country and we have such a small audience base in terms of, uh, you know, four million, and uh, it's very hard uh, to to do that on a full time basis uh, with a company. But to be able to uh, mount Mary Poppins recently, uh, as I'm sure many of you know. Uh, with an opening night of, uh, as Sean said, 1,900 people uh, uh, and to be able to have that opportunity. I think we'd ask the cast to come on stage that night, just sing one song and walk off after a bow. Everyone would have been satisfied. Uh, so uh, incredibly lucky for us. Uh, so we do feel very privileged to be in that position. Um, saying that, it's a, it's a, it is still quite a mixed bag in New Zealand. Um, many of the uh, full-time theatre companies, our, our, our Auckland Theatre Company, have elected to 
pencil productions of various sizes. Um, uh, we've had, you know, operas moved into 2021. Uh, we've had a lot of dance things and comedy things uh, still moving because people haven't been, um, I guess, uh, willing to put, uh, you know, their money and their, um, their, their livelihoods, I guess, at risk of people not wanting to go to theatres. Uh, but what I'd say, certainly from our point of view, is, is uh, if you can find ways to work with people to get your events to stage at some point when it's safe from the virus and, and when you've got protocols in place, um, people are desperate to get back into theatres. And there's no doubt from our season that we saw um, uh, audiences very willing to go back in. In fact, um, because New Zealand's in a, in a good place with COVID, you know, uh, ap apart from our matinee performances, we saw very few people in masks. Um, a lot of people, you know, using their tracking uh, codes and things like that, but very few people in masks. It was a challenge for us from the beginning to, to get it to stage, as Sean said, with uh, having to rehearse in masks and, and shift dates. Um, so a, a little bit of background, we, we, we pulled the production in April, we had it planned to open on the 2nd of October and we were ready to go basically for the 2nd of October, but we had to shift it because of our uh, lockdown levels that we have in New Zealand, we had to shift it by two weeks. And even with that, uh, you'll find we never got uh, any complaints really from uh, customers um, re regarding shifting of tickets what we're finding is people are very, uh, you know, I guess tenacious, we've all been tenacious to, to get to this point. And, and even, you know, um, our audiences are very willing to go for the ride with us to, to get back into the theatre. So um, from that point of view, uh, I guess Mary Poppins has been a, a delight for us to be part of. Um, so as I say, the rest of the industry is, is probably, um, struggling a little bit. We did get wage subsidies, as Sean was saying, for people. Um, and there was about 75 million given by the government for funding, but a lot of that went to, you know, your museums, um, to our, our, our full-time national companies like the National Ballet and the Opera. Um, so, but the individual contractors, to be honest, uh, uh, a little bit of the, <clears throat> the story I'm hearing from everybody, we're a little bit unheard and uh, very hard to find ways to get money from, um, from the government for, for losses that have been incurred uh, along the way. Um, uh, our Prime Minister actually at the time was our Minister of the Arts and we were very lucky to get her to a, a preview of Mary Poppins um, and to talk to the cast and uh, to, you know, to, to hear our voice, I guess. We had our, uh, uh, one of our um, young uh, boys playing uh, Michael Banks in the production actually did a wee speech to her and thanking her, but also, uh, you know, uh, asking her to think about the arts and how, you know, help us get open and, and get people back into theatres. So uh, from that point of view, uh, again, very lucky. So. Lots of cancelled events, as Sean said, we are open for business now in terms of most events, but uh, you know, we, we know that that can happen, that can change at any given time, given um, the current, until we get a virus, uh, and, uh, sorry, a, um, uh, uh, you know what I'm saying, a, 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 an answer to that virus. Um, so, uh, there are there are lots of events planned. We we New Zealand's a bit reliant on a lot of, um, especially with the musical theatre side of uh, international promoters coming into the country. Really, we're not going to see any of that till twenty twenty two. It sounds like in terms of international people coming into New Zealand, as we know because of travel restrictions. Um, however, what we are seeing in New Zealand, which is really exciting, is people taking up the opportunity and actually not looking at it as a, because we're starting to uh, have our theatres available, there's a lot of um, startup projects coming in of all sizes. Um, we ourselves have decided to do um, Jersey Boys next year, and we've just launched that, and again, uh, you know, in April next year, uh, there's a lot of excitement around that, uh, and it's providing 
you know, uh, work for, you know, 30 to 40 people in the industry to get that on. Um, and, you know, with, even with recent auditions, we were, we were uh, overwhelmed with people coming in to audition for that. And so there is a hunger to get stuff on. Uh, and, yeah, I guess it's exciting to see overall. Fantastic. Thank you so very much. And good morning. Um, I will need to uh, do a little swappy because Gemma needs to go very soon. Uh, so apologies, Dinesh and uh, Larity. Can um, ladies first, Gemma, go first um, about her experience in touring during COVID times? Um, because she needs to go in like 10 minutes. Yeah, sorry, Dinesh, and sorry, Larry, of taking your time. I will be, I'll try to, to, to fit into the five minutes. And thank you. Good morning and good evening to everybody. Um, thank you, Mayu, for organizing this. I think it's very important and really, really interesting. Everything that has been said, really, uh, uh, showing how different is the approach by each country and, and how differently can we really uh, deal with the with the alarming and, and uh, triggering issues as performing arts in COVID or post COVID era. Uh, um, I will start from what Grant was uh, talking about. Uh, something that uh, uh, for me it's really important as I'm uh, I'm working as an actress and as a director uh, internationally and and traveling around, touring around a lot. And so, especially when the pandemia uh, happened, um, the fact of traveling was, of course, impossible in the beginning. Uh, with the mass, it was proven that we could actually keep on traveling and keep on working, uh, given certain measure and certain safety um, uh, checks uh, that allowed uh, me and many, many colleagues, colleagues of mine uh, traveling and, uh, and working uh, physically, uh, in presence, in many venues, in Greece, in, uh, in Italy, and in Sweden, as, as my friends has already told. Uh, I have Italian and Swedish origins, so I will not talk about Sweden as I've been already uh, uh, ex uh, yeah, extensively uh, spoken about. Uh, I can talk about the Italian situation a bit, uh, which is disastrous. As, as, at least as, uh, as the Greek one, I, I was listening to Nikos and, to, and uh, I was uh, really, uh, I, I found striking how many similarities we are facing with the Greek uh, art workers. Um, so uh, to make a long story short, what's happening in Italy is actually the lockdown, the total lockdown of every cultural and artistic activities since October. Uh, I'm talking, of course, about the second lockdown uh, or what we are like talking as a second wave of the, of, the, of the pandemic. In the first lockdown, of course, everything was closed. The artists uh, in Italy reacted quite well. They were uh, trying to, of course, they, they supported the decision and they were trying to, to make anyway some kind of activities that could uh, be a kind of an example of uh, resistance and resilience in this in these hard times. Uh, though the the state support was completely uh, uh, nullos, so uh, what we had from 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 the cultural minister was uh, very very few money uh, for the institutions and for the freelancers as well. Uh, actually, it's in, I would like to stress out the fact that the first call out for state support for the freelance art workers uh, was uh, so uh, um, like was was made uh, in a way that very very few people could apply, and uh, I'm talking about uh, um, one of the criteria was that to have 30 days uh, of insured and paid work. The, of the previous year, so if you if you can think about that, a country and a country as Italy, uh, the whole uh, of the art workers could not apply to this simple for for uh, due to the simple fa fact that they could not prove uh, uh, thirty days of work of the previous year. It's quite uh, striking and and quite uh, as I said, catastrophic and disastrous. So they they were forced 
to reduce the, the, the minimum uh, working days, uh, tax paid working days, to seven days. Still, many artists cannot apply. The few artists that could apply and they got the, the um, eligibility, they still are, many of them are still waiting for the money to arrive to their bank accounts. Uh, the very, like this kind of little, we are talking about 600 euros per month for two months only. Um, now they are saying that they will try to uh, extend this uh, support again, of course, with the second wave and with the second lockdown. Art workers are now uh, uh, getting under and under. There are some uh, manifestations and they're trying to have a kind of a dialogue and a, and a kind of panel uh, with the minister, the minister of culture. Uh, Franceschini, the minister of culture, is replying in quite a disrespectful way, I have to say, and uh, mocking the actors and, uh, and the theater workers and art workers in general saying that they are uh, post, like they're prioritizing their own will instead of saying the, the greater good, etc., etc., which is totally, I'm sorry for the French, a total bullshit, because it is proven that since the theater have been reopened in Italy, and we're talking about the 15th of June, 2020, till the second lockdown, uh, um, uh, it was the 1st of October, more than three, Thousand, three fifty thousand spectators have joined shows with all uh, the measures required by the ministers. So in a completely safe environment, and among these three three uh, hundred five uh, five thousand um, spectators, only one COVID case has been um, collected. So it has been proven that performing physically and live in theater, even with a pandemic, could really work. And I want to stress this out. I'm uh, replying to Brian before. Yes, it is possible. It is. I'm talking now about the first personal uh, experience. I was involved in, uh, in the activist uh, um, production that uh, Eleftheria was mentioning before, the, a Greek, a Swedish production uh, that was supposed to uh, to premiere in uh, physically in May in Athens. Of course, it was cancelled. I was in Athens when the first lockdown happened and I managed to go back to Italy. And uh, we all decided to keep on working in this project. Luckily, the contact served the new media and we used Zoom, the platform Zoom, as a way of delivering the show. And uh, this dragged us through the whole first lockdown. And with, when the theaters could open again in Greece and in Italy, um, we had the possibility of premiering live and physically in many different festivals in Europe. The biggest was Roma Europa Festival in, uh, in the beginning of October. And the measures that really could regulate and could offer and guarantee safety for us as performers and for the for the spectators were amazing and it is possible absolutely uh, we have been tested we, we we were keeping the distancing the social distancing so what i'm what i experience uh, in italy is a total discri discri discrimination of the cultural and artistic activities especially the um, let's say the independent uh, groups and the avant-garde groups have been hardly, hardly uh, uh, conditioned by this. Uh, some in institutions and some theater, uh, the biggest theater, the National Theater in Italy, uh, have started now with some kind of program that uh, exactly as Elefteria was mentioning, they are more in the direction of education and um, rehearsing, like let's say research, artistic research uh, processes, which is really inspiring and, and really brings a lot of hope, but they are not enough. And it, I'm talking about two, three uh, institutions that are uh, very, very courageously uh, taking the money that the minister has have granted them to make the artists work, even when it's not possible to deliver a show. 
even when the, the stages are closed, even when the audience does not uh, come to the show. Um, so um, I don't know how to conclude this speech, but uh, on a way, yes, it is possible to continue our work and we have to demand this now because we have proof that this is possible. Uh, many different systems in many different countries. So really we have to uh, uh, demand to our governments to make this possible. And secondly, uh, I, I, can just, uh, I can just give to you my, my personal experience as, as a freelance, the, the, uh, the condition that we, are, that we are facing are extremely hard. All my productions that are international and big productions involving, you know, uh, uh, theaters from Greece, uh, Sweden, and Italy, national theaters, they have been postponed or canceled. We, we still don't, don't have any answer. But in this total limbo, in this total uh, uh, limen uh, uh, dimension, I have to say that I found uh, a big uh, source of inspiration and strength in my colleagues and in the fact that, that we found ourselves totally uh, outside of the, the normal practices, the normal procedures, the normal production procedures. This allowed me and many artists as myself to freely create and freely rethink the production system and freely think about the relation that we establish with our audience, the identity of our audience our identities as artists in our times. And I think this is an incredible momentum of not letting this uh, um, um, opportunity go away. We have to uh, hang on in here. <laughs> it's hard. I, I don't have any money left in my bank account. <laughs> I'm doing other kind of jobs, if possible. Now they're locking us down again, so it's not possible anyway to work and to earn any money. But we have to be honest and we have to be sincere in this hardness and this harshness. Uh, I think it's the only way of um, surviving, actually, as artists. I'm not talking about us. You know. Thanks so much. That was amazing and inspiring. Um, Thank you so much. Thank I'm you. sorry I have to leave. Uh, um, I just want to say that uh, any questions, uh, may you, may, maybe you could uh, keep them and I will try to answer if there are, of course, but uh, I will be very glad to keep in touch with all of you. It's very, I'm very glad to, to, to see your face and, and to hear your words. Thank you. Absolutely. So we jump um, to India um, and Dinesh, Yaza, who's a director and designer, um, she's been waiting patiently. Um, hi, Dinesh, are you there? Yeah, it's, I think the fun of being the third world country is that you can wait. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, but I think that, that was more on a sarcastic level, but anyway. Um, hi, my name is Dinesh Yadav and I'm a theater director designer these days based in United States. Uh, so I know that there is overwhelmingly people from United States. So I think I divert myself to India. But yes, I belong to India. I came to United States just two years back. And uh, my, uh, my sense of my theatricality is still back to India. So I will, I think there has been a lot uh, said from the United States point of view. So I will leave that for this moment. And I will focus on on India. Uh, it, it, the, to understand Indian theatrical situation, I think we have to understand what is India is and uh, how this is different from any other uh, European or Eurocentric or American uh, theater practices. Uh, in India, theater is not an industry, uh, primarily. Uh, 
theater is more uh, a lively uh, sort of a part of a culture. It's a part of daily life. Uh, and in India, again, consider that there is no one single language. So there are um, 20 official languages, and there are about uh, more than 200 dialects. Uh, so now Indian states are divided more or less on the base of language. So that means every state has a specific language and very specific culture to those states uh, in India. When it comes to culture, when I'm saying culture, that means uh, it goes back to the language, it goes back to the uh, food habits, it goes back to songs, it goes back to theater practices and so on. So now in India, uh, the Indian theater is kind of, you can group Indian theater in four major categories, uh, urban theater, rural theater, traditional theater, and uh, sort of uh, contemporary theater. These are four uh, major categories. Uh, urban theater is more or less modern quote unquote uh, theater and rural theater is more traditional theater. And in traditional theater, then you do have classical theater and you do have, uh, you know, folk tra traditions. So I don't want to give you a lecture on Indian theater, but the idea that we understand from where it comes. So now when a large part of Indian theater is traditional practices, that means people practice those forms just as part of their daily life uh, on occasions, on events, or just in the evenings. Uh, Sometimes they are also ritualistic. So a part of those performance can be ritualistic and can again be part of just the daily life. Now saying that, that means because a large part of theater is part of the daily culture, government does not consider those as employments or is, is not employed thing. So theater in India, that's why the, there is no company for theater or there are no such theater houses. There are performing proscenium venues or open air venues, uh, sometimes uh, constructed by government, sometimes constructed by private bodies, but hardly there is any company which has a theater house. So there is no national theater, national opera, national musical, there is nothing that sort of notions. What is there is a unique phenomena, especially in urban setting, which is called group theater, which is also in rural theater. Group theater means generally people from all kinds of background will come and they will do theater just for their hobby or their fun. So that is a large part of theatrical tradition. Now, traditional artists who has been performing, you know, uh, practicing these forms since like ages, uh, they are primarily supported by their own local communities because they don't perform for a quote unquote consolidated audience, rather they perform for communities. So let's say there is a Jatra performance or there is a Yakshgana performance from Karnataka or there is a you know Bihu performance from Assam. They will basically perform their community and their community you know, kind of contribute that and give it to those artists. So saying that the traditional artists, which were more or less uh, supported by communities, uh, or there is another phenomena which called a Jajman phenomena, which is a very interesting phenomena. Jajman phenomena is that where is a rich person will basically adopt a community of artists. And this is, I'm talking about Western Rajasthan, Western desert part. And this rich person will basically support these artists. The artist's job is to primarily go into specific occasions at this rich person's house and sing or perform. So this is, this is a more or less the condition of the traditional theater. Now, traditional theater is more into rural, more into small communities. So that means people uh, in villages and in small villages. So that means people can still meet together, they can perform, they can touch things together and they can do things. So 
the lively these are the artists which were never rich at all which has the art practicing is been part of their life but it's complicated that whether that they were supported 100% by art practices or they had a second job to basically survive them there are communities which been traditionally performing artists which don't do anything else other than performance but they are primarily supported by their communities so there is a very low stake of government there then comes the urban theater where there were there is large amount of traditional artists who were migrant to urban centers uh, in search of you know better opportunities and then there is a good amount of trained actors designers directors and so on who were primarily freelancers so there is nothing as such a body which uh, you know employ artist other than couple of big schools let's say national school of drama in new delhi which has his own staff or universities uh, there are about 20 universities which has theater department uh, there are couple of performing art centers like national center for performing art in mumbai which is supported by tatas uh, so these centers have their own staff which was never like a full staff or never like running theatrical companies or repertory companies they don't generally have a repertory company the repertory companies which are generally have in urban centers primarily they are supported by a funding grant called repertory grant of ministry of culture which been a very 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 minimal and primarily going into the pockets of the repertory owners or director due to one or the other algorithm of the corruption so actors were hardly or performers are hardly getting much out of those grants you know so again you know into urban center then you do have these uh quote and quote repertory actors which were again has to do something else in order in order to support them in urban settings then we come to the uh, freelance theater practitioners i think the hardest hit are those guys the freelancers because they are in urban centers so they have to pay their rent uh because they were primarily based on gig work so going here and there maybe sometime doing three work at a time taking little money because again theater is not ticket based in india primarily is more or less based on again you know donations or advertisement so freelance directors or designers or actor were again probably doing two to three jobs at a time to support them in urban settings they are the hardest hit and there is no support structure for them no government money has so far been allocated for uh, for performing artist unfortunately uh, there have been the there been some support structure in terms of providing uh, food packages and so on but they are not paying their rents you know the, their government is not supporting them to pay their rents so what had happened that a large amount of those artists has gone back to their ancestral home or their villages so now the urban centers are more or less getting empty from artists or these artists are being shifted trying to shift to do something else during this time of period and maybe probably they might have figured out something like a, a sitting into a computer shop and doing a running an internet cafe you know so that so and that's that's the reality so this is the overall uh, uh, sort of scenario of the art performance in general uh, let me go back to my notes uh, now in terms of the performing venues what had happened that indian government announced a lockdown on 24th of march and that been extended three times till 31st of may till they figure out that Uh, this pandemic is not going to be in their control and this is kind of overwhelming then they leave it like an uncontrolled horse that okay you can run as as much as you run and then once you kind of uh, run out of your energy that's fine you know we have 1.5 billion people so hardly matter you know if like 100 million die at something you know? so, so that's the problem of being too much of population in a country that government it does not matter to government unfortunately 
it, politically it can matter, but we had just elections in India in in couple of states. Bihar was one of those. Today was counting is going on, and there were massive rallies, massive massive rallies, just around the state, and all the parties were doing those rallies. So it's not that you know, uh, Democrat or liberals were doing in 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 United States. It's like everyone was doing. So I think government has somehow uh, leave this idea that we can control this virus. And social distancing and you know, mask and all those are like, uh, those are considered as privileged point of view. In India, which is a country crowded in, in especially in cities, uh, social distancing or physical distancing, I would say rather, is impossible. Masking can be possible, but again, you know, this is a, it's a country which is poorest of poor to richest of rich. So, you know, sometimes you just can't afford those things or you are ignorant so much that after some point of time, you think, ah, oh, it does not matter, you know, I'm... So that is the situation of the pandemic there. Okay. Uh, now, yeah. sorry. Government, what government has did that in states, government has, central government has leave it complete to state that you plan your own policies when it comes to gathering and so on. There are a state which has allowed 100 people gathering and so on. But again, you know, in India, this is the wedding season. Uh, the weddings are happening and people are dancing in the streets and stuff <laughs> on, on DJ songs. So that is also a bizarre. Uh, in between the in Delhi, which is kind of capital, Delhi government says that you can have gathering with hundred persons uh, with mask and uh, physical distancing. Venues performing venues hasn't been so far open, but outdoor activities has been allowed. That you can have outdoor event with uh, people wearing mask. What had been done so far, but interestingly, that government has challenged people not wearing mask and has basically got money from out of people's po pocket to support themselves, to buy PPE or something. So if I'm in Delhi, if I'm not wearing mask, in an in a area which is not crowded, I, it's pretty much chance that I will be fine. But if I'm in old Delhi, which is overly crowded, uh, you know, police does not bother to give to give me a challenge. So it's an it's an interesting concept to to give back to people and take out from their pocket, uh, just to kind of a chain reaction. You know, I will give you, then I will take you from that. That's a complex nature of those kind of countries. In India, what had happened that because the population there is a larger population of India lives in villages. And village were able to basically quarantine themselves. I, I talk about my village where my father lived. There are about thousand people live in a small block of you know houses. They were what they had their own policy that we will not allow outsiders generally uh, to roam around in the village, and that you know uh, anyone who is coming from the big cities has to quarantine themselves. So village were able to. Uh, control the pandemic. And in between what had happened that especially performing artists, traditional performing artists were able to basically support themselves, especially I'm saying, when I say support means basic livelihood, that means uh, food for two times. They were able to support themselves through these mentorship that, you know, in village, there are a couple of people who has uh, uh, possibilities of supporting with food, they will give these traditional artists for the time being. So this is what has been happened. Uh, I would take one more minute to reflect back on this whole idea of we've been coming here and we've been talking about this and that's how you know it's been hit and why the government does not bother. I think somewhere theater failed, unfortunately, into contemporary era. Uh, especially into 19th, later 19th century and 20th century. And that is because of the Western and Broadway. I think these are two very city organizations, frankly speaking, and you can curse me just because of, I think when we take theater and we say that theater is an industry, we are primarily denying that theater is a essential job. Theater is a medicine. 
we are denying that theater is medicine for the society and it is as much required as the medical support system is required. In the United States, there is a 46% of the population who is severely loneliness. Dr. Vivek Murthy, who was the Surgeon General of United States, wrote in his book together that loneliness is as lethal as smoking 10 cigarettes a day. Theater being medically proven, that is medically the most effective way of treating people with loneliness and depression. What theater persons has failed in terms of advocating that we are medicine to society? Consider that in India, there are about 10 million people who consider themselves as an artist or who are traditional artists. Consider that if they are not artists, what they would have been doing? Anything else? Depressed, deprived, can go to any, do anything, steal things, drugs, anything. That is the situation, I think, more or less everywhere into the society. And I'm not talking about practicing artists. I'm talking about to whom the artists are, serve, are basically serving. If we are serving 20% to 30% of the population's mental health, we are essential workers. What we need to advocate as an organization or international platforms is to advocate that we are medicine to the society. If we are not there, it's 100% or 200% proof that the society will collapse. Thank you. That was, yeah. Amazing. So last but not least, we have uh, Laerti Vasili from Albania, who's an actor and director of the National Theatre there. Um, so yeah, Laerti, are you there? Open up. Oh, I just opened my mic. I don't know. Hello to everybody. Uh, do you listen to me? Yep, yep. Everything's cool. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Uh, so because I have my Zoom application on my phone, because my laptop just crashed out during the quarantine so <laughs> uh, thank you Mayu uh, for this uh, organization I think it's very very important but especially for um, art workers uh, like me coming from very small countries like uh, for your information Albania it's a country of uh, two million people so it's like a normal big city in Europe. Um, what happened in Albania during the last year, it was a little bit uh, like um, coming by a tragic fate because Albania uh, one year ago was hit but, uh, by uh, three very tremendous earthquakes. Uh, so, uh, before COVID-19 strikes, we closed the theater because of the earthquakes. So uh, the gathering and the people coming to the theater was forbidden because uh, during a month, uh, we were in a situation that every day two or three little earthquakes were shooking the whole territory of Albania. And uh, it was a little bit not so quite uh, sh sure for people to be inside theater. Then the pandemic comes and uh, we were again forced to close the theater. Uh, but uh, something good despite all of these uh, atrocities, something good were the, uh, was that uh, we still take our salaries. I'm an actor and director in the National Theatre of Albania. I'm of Greek origin. I used to be working in Greece and studying Greece for 20 years. Uh, but... Uh, some years ago, I tried to put on a production in Greece and uh, the Nazi party using the name Golden Dawn attacked the theater. Uh, 
we stopped the performance. They wanted to burn out the theater and they, they threat all of us and our families with our lives. Uh, so six years ago, I was forced to leave Greece uh, and to come to my country of birth, to Albania. Uh, so my experience of having a theater closed down goes back to 2012. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, all this meeting is about reinventing theater during the COVID times. Uh, uh, but also, like the first speaker uh, that said that uh, our politicians does not have uh, the brain to understand us, the artist. And many times they almost always, uh, they think that uh, doing theater is something to entertain, just to entertain the people. Uh, but there has been periods during the history that people saved human lives. So it's not about joking and laughing, but anyhow. Uh, so one good thing that happened in Albania it is that, uh, ah, sorry, I have to explain to you that there are no, uh, there is no such notion as private theater in Albania. Mm. Because uh, a private uh, a building and the private production inside that building uh, cannot make it. Mm. I just can stress this out and mention to you that in Albania you can come and watch a performance in the National Theatre of Albania uh, paying a ticket of uh, three or four euros uh, and that's standard uh, but at least uh, for us the actors of the National Theatre and the other two theatres, the Experimental Theatre, the National Experimental Theatre of Albania and the Metropolitan Theatre, which is the theatre of the city of Tirana, and ten other theatres that are in the Republic, in the territory of Albania, they are all uh, sustained by state and uh, no actors, uh, no actor was missing his salary during all these times. Uh, a problem that occurred in Albania, it's uh, with uh, that um, that we called uh, a freelance actor or director. In that, the mayor uh, city hall of Albania, of Tirana, uh, after months and months of discussion since the earthquakes of September 2000, 2019, uh, they made a program where uh, the city hall financed uh, freelance production of actors and directors in theater with the half of the cost of production. And then you have to go out and find some, you know, donation, sponsorship, and things like this. Uh, from that point of view, I think that uh, being a small country uh, helped us with not so much loss during the pandemic times for theater and uh, not so much economical loss uh, because we still uh, are getting our payment. Uh, and our payment is uh, it's a salary by the state, uh, which in Albania uh, occurs to uh, five to six hundred euros per month. Uh, and defining that, uh, I just have to inform you that you can live in Tirana in a two hundred euro uh, apartment near the center. So you can make a living. Uh, in uh, contrary of my 20 years uh, 
studying, living, and working uh, in different theaters in Athens and in all Greece. And I want to thank uh, Nikos Hadzopoulos for mentioning it, Nikos uh, Dengzoran Makus, for mentioning it in the beginning that the situation of actors in Greece, it is really horrible. And uh, yes, I'm stressing this out because it, it is a neighboring country and uh, we, in the National Theatre of Albania, uh, we lack of collaboration even with neighboring countries uh, or with countries that have a huge tradition and big history in theater and are, and theater it's really industry in that countries. Uh, mentioning here Germany or United Kingdom or France and other countries also. Uh, during the last year, uh, it was uh, for the it was a, a theater year in Albania. Uh, at least the old uh, building where the National Theatre of Albania uh, has its uh, two stages built by the Italians, uh, by the fascist regime of Italian uh, in 1939, which was uh, a building that uh, has lost uh, every um, meaning of its functionality. And that building uh, now it's demolished and it's going to be built a new theater, a new national theater for Albania. And for these three or four years, uh, the government of Albania uh, built uh, a new theater at uh, the lake of the city of Tirana, almost in the city center, uh, for the National Theater to be uh, housed there and, to, and for us to have our performances and everything. Uh, but the problem was that uh, as a small country, uh, everything in Albania is uh, politics. Uh, so, from a group of people that they called themselves uh, the aliens for the theater, uh, they kept hostage the theater building for one year without letting uh, the continuity of the process of building a new national theater in Albania. So, uh, all this year, in uh, Tirana has been uh, uh, a year of uh, a big uh, theatrical events and uh, struggling. That's it. Thank you for your time. Thank you so uh, much, <laughs> Trying um, to be inside the five minutes. <laughs> Um, I said, I said, wow, when we first started, uh, I don't know how many wows I can say now, to be honest, um, for everyone and their contributions and patience. And um, I need to also thank Elina Pieribu, which is, who's in the list. She's socially distancing with myself in this office here. Um, and she was just making sure that a connection dropped off. She could pick up uh, just as there were too many people uh, hanging on on this link. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, when I first called the Zoom, the theatres were open in most countries that just spoke. So um, that comes to show the fragility of it all right now. Um, so um, we can open it up for a chat. We can have until six if you all want to. Um, and uh, all attendees can unmute themselves or at will and ask questions if you want. Um, yeah. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can now. Yeah, the question was just to anybody who knows Athens. How it makes
I Bill, I think oh, Signal oh, is not very good. Uh, so I will just try and read what you've written in the chat for everyone, which is Greek artists or whoever knows about Greek. How can this just... make sense alongside the Nyakos Opera House and all that money? I'm not sure what your 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 question is about. Uh, Nyakos Opera House is a private institution. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that it has to provide for every Greek artist. Uh, what exactly, I'm not sure what exactly is your, your question. <coughs> I'm sorry, I can't, we can't hear you, I'm, I'm not sure if... Yeah, I think we've got a bit of trouble with correction. Yeah. I think I think if I can if I understand correctly, it's just the juxtaposition of the freelancers and then the big opera houses having the money. And yes. there is really really a big difference between these two. Not only the big dancers and the, the opera having money, but also the national theatres and the, the, the what we call private theatre or free theatre or whatever, but not not national. Uh, national theatres are still working, not producing, not producing uh, shows, not having audience, but they still keep their contracts with the, the, the actors and the actors are paid till the end of their contract. Quite the opposite happens to the other sector, which is um, um, private theatre. Not only uh, uh, the theatres are in suspension, but uh, many of them have not even yet uh, had the time to to have the contracts before the lockdown began. So uh, people, uh, the, not only actors, but also uh, any kind of artist who are going to work in there now has not has nothing to prove that he was going to work there. So he's out of every measure of support from the, the state. That's it. And that's all because we don't have any uh, laws governing the, um, um, uh, the way of the economical, uh, 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 you know, um, give and take in theatre. After the after the after the financial crisis, all the, all these laws were abolished. It's, it was the only way to get loan from International Monetary Fund and the European Bank. Great. Um, Katie Holly, I think, had a question. Do you want to ask it, Katie? Um, uh, sure. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I ju I'll just read what I wrote into the... Um, I was so interested by so many things that have been discussed, but I know that we're short on time, so I'll try to be brief. Um, I was interested, um, how do we form the language to convince the public and governments, etc., that the arts and the theatre are medicine for society, as was so beautifully put by Dinesh. Um, I know that, in, like where I'm from in Ireland, there was an amazing campaign launched by uh, the National Campaign for the Arts uh, about, you know, uh, basically little memes that were on social media and in the newspapers saying, if, if you read a book, that is the arts. If you watch a film, that is the arts. If you see a short little video on YouTube, that is the arts. And so please support the arts. And that was that was a really um, great way that we got a momentum going, which eventually got the government to give us extra money. Um, but I'm, I'm really interested by how do we strategize and form the language to convince the public of how important the arts are? That was my first question. Will I ask my second question as well? It's a totally different one. <laughs> um, has anyone experienced resistance from artists or theatres to the use of new media, um, audio, digital, performing outside? I am very open to um, these uh, different ways of working, but I have uh, come up against some resistance from other artists who are just very strongly feeling like, no, we need to keep working live, which is not possible in Ireland at the moment because we're at level five, um, or we need to wait until live performance is possible. And I just think that's a little bit short-sighted because we don't know how long we will be in this position. So I'm just interested in your response to that. So, uh, Katie, because I put that uh, notion up here in this form, I can go and give my opinion, but that does not mean that I don't want others to put opinion 
on about art as medicine. Uh, specifically, when you talk about the language, I think uh, the artist community has to push it through UNESCO uh, to making art as an essential work. Uh, the definitions can be varied from country to country, region to region, what they consider as an art. But when I say the medicine, that means there is an amount of in-person uh, component there uh, that in a form which involves persons meeting together in a physical space is a, that is my understanding of of using art as a therapeutic or art as an essential uh, for the society uh, although otherwise uh, anything then can be art this i can say that this when we are meeting here on zoom this can be art because art is a, such a vivid term to define it there has to be some definition around it what we consider art when we consider art as a therapeutic or uh, as as an essential work uh, that that is my understanding of uh, about the second question being using digital media into the form of art or theater i'm sorry uh, I think from the time immortal the theater has been existing in this world, the very essential component of theater is where a spectator and actions are in the same space. And where these two components together synthesize to bring a common sense of common experience. As soon you take out that common experience away from the air, then for me theater is gone within that common experience i can if i can bring anything art or satellite or moon or mars i don't have any issue but this has to be an experience which act, which action in a space and audience in a space create together if that's been too philosophical you can counter me but that's what my understanding thank you I think if I if I may disagree slightly, um, that it's the the lack of a communal audience is the problem. If one can very satisfyingly go to the cinema in normal times and have a communal experience without being in the same space as the performer, it isn't as the same. It isn't the same as being in a shared space with the performer. But I think the real lack is not that that we as artists are separated from the audience, but the audience is separated from itself. when i say communal experience is not individual experience or uh, the the communal experience is a common experience i can see oedipus and perceive it my with my own cultural context the same oedipus you can see and you can perceive it with your com, com, your cultural context but that perceiveness this emotional outburst which i had and then meeting with that outburst with yours and yours with another one, but is what it is the the theatrical experience. That's what I mean by the common experience. It's not that I want to understand Oedipus uh, same performance by everyone with the same intensity and same uh, level of interpretation. I don't think I mean that. The beauty of theater that it gives everyone to imagine their own moon while you are hanging a light. Uh, just in front of the psyche. I perceive it my own moon coming from India, you perceive it your moon, and maybe someone else perceives. But it's a moon, it's the moonness of the moon, which I mean. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, but I would like to uh, say something now because uh, Katie, uh, I think. Um, she asked something about uh, the new media performances uh, via Zoom, internet, so. And um, I'm thinking that uh, in the future, we are about to see that we, we actors, we are going to play on stage and you, you are sitting in, how, in your houses, in your uh, sofa, you are going to see it via your computer or your uh, uh, television. But I'm, I'm thinking about the future now, 
uh, how it will be for our actors. I, 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 I'm, I'm starting feeling new, a new way of um, auditions. Uh, so that we are about to make uh, videos now. We have to be very good making videos uh, and um, testing ourselves uh, in uh, some theater auditions also and film auditions also. We are we are front of a new way. I don't know. It's 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 it's, it's very. Sometimes it's, my, my, we can feel afraid, but sometimes this this is also something beautiful. Okay, should I make it? Let's try it. Let's try. Let's let's try find what is cool to make on something like this. But I, yeah. That it was something about the multimedia and the theater and um, yeah. If I um, if I may respond, uh, Casey, um, and what's lovely, Casey, is that I hear an Irish voice. I'm Irish and I'm in the UK, and I come from a culture in Ireland. So just to give a context of Ireland in training for performing practices is that before university level there is no formal education within the education system for drama or theatre within within schools and um, so i grew up being incredibly curious um, i'm lincoln i am um, a proximal uh, physical theatre trained performer practitioner director artist um, but I'm also a cyber networked online performer and I'm the one of the founders of a, a thing called 1001 Fires and uh, which started as a group of people kind of just asking these questions um, and I'm saying to the organizers by the way we would like to prop you up uh, which is why I've come um, and share and, and share all these activities which have been amazing. But for me, there's a whole plethora of things. Firstly, like there is uh, there is not a difference, but there is a difference only in the relations. Theatre is live both in networked online cyber performance in addition to proximal performance. What is the problem is that many people are placing the value systems of proximal performance onto the cyber online networks performance practice. Those of us who've been working in cyber network, digital, etc., performance practice for many, many years have seen this real crisis predominantly from embodied practitioners, predominantly from um, proximal uh, performance and practitioners and, and makers and creators. I don't necessarily think that it is useful to celebrate a tension and a distinction between the proximal and between the online, cyber, et cetera, and, it, and to promote a divide. It is, it, I think for me, the recognition that they are different, and I said this to many people that have rung me up, going, Lynn, 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 help me to do my performance on, online. Help me to do this, help me to do that. Tell me how to do this. And one of my answers has been, realistically, you are trying to create something. It is like trying to create a musical theatre performance, but judging it as a no theatre uh, practice. So you're coming from no theatre, I'm coming from musical theatre. There are very different things. There are very different things. But with this stuff, like there are groups and 1000 on Fires is only one, but there are groups and loads of groups of artists who are coming together around the world in this amazing force and going, I'm not going to legitimize myself to the government. I'm not going to legitimize myself by categorizing my work as medicine, by categorizing my work in the value systems of others. I'm an artist. I will stand up and be an artist. I will fight to be an artist. This is my life. This is my right. And what I do within this time is that I, I use the time and the legacy of beautiful other artists who have given me a beautiful legacy and a beautiful training to mean I can build a website, to mean I, I'm a filmmaker, to mean that I'm a sonographer, to mean that I'm an actress. And I gift that back to other artists. 
And I think if there's anything coming from this moment, it's the acts of kindness, a generosity of a barter system, which is outside modes of production, which is outside a capitalist, capitalist agenda, and which is outside pandering to government and societal pressures. We're bloody artists. And we, all of us in this room, are bloody amazing. And we are activists and we are revolution. We are absolutely revolutionary. And what they're trying to do is to silence us. But we won't be bloody silent. So every single one of you, go and be radical. And go and do what you can do in these times. I'm not asking you to do more or less, but do what is right by you. Find what you need to do and go and do it for you, not for anyone else. And if you want some help, drop me an email. <laughs> do you mind, Lynn, putting your, your, um, your email address or the name of your company, what, what you mentioned in the chat? Because that was just fantastic. <laughs> yeah, Lynn. yeah it, it, it's not really a company. It's just, it's, it's there to prop up other artists. So it's membership is free and it's just propping up other people. We're just a group of people who work together. And... Again, I extend that offer to the people organizing this a fantastic event that we would like to share your stuff and promote that and put it all on our social medias and pages and, and stuff like that. Um, I'll pop it in the chat. If you send me everything, um, I mean, just a reminder that you can save the chat. Um, there's a function that um, yeah. you can all save the chat. And I will try and extract as well the uh, links and put them in a file, all of them together. So Lynn, if you want to add your links in the chat. Sure. Be incredible. Lynn, I, I don't want to make this platform as a platform of debate, and I also don't want to sound politically debatable. But when I said that art is a medicine, the, I think the problem of theater is that when it comes to surviving, we want to ride on everyone's other shoulder when it comes to share our resources, we don't want to do that. When it comes, to, we want to ride on paintings, we want to ride on music, we want to ride on any other form's shoulder when it's problem. When it's sharing, we don't want to do that. Why? And why I said that we want, we have to advocate that we are the medicine for the society. This is not, I'm talking about the 20th century. This is, had been there since the, the genesis of theater. And I want to distinguish theater from any other art form. Though theater is a composite art form, but I think it's distinguished. The distinguishity is the compositeness, the togetherness of theater. Any other art form in this whole world, you can perform, you can create just being individual. The essentiality, the, the idea of theater is in the core of the heart of togetherness. When you take to that togetherness out from the theater, you are essentially making anything other than the theater. What makes theater distinguish is that phenomena of to togetherness and creating a together emotional connectivity. That's right. And I think that togetherness is what is medicine to the society. When I'm saying that it's medicine to the society, that togetherness. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and actually, my, um, my provocation and my spurring wasn't necessarily reacting to you. I come from a culture, my training, proximal training comes from a company called Odin Theatre in Denmark by a, a director called Eugenia Barber. And what he said, so I'm projecting my culture, my professional culture onto this. And what he said is that I come from a culture of individuals finding the meaning of their theatre. And in these times, I feel like each individual needs to find the meaning of what's important to them and do that. Not for that to be defined by what others are telling us to do. When I, when I use the example of medicine, it certainly wasn't to, to react or as a revolution or a, against yours. I mean, if your meaning is to categorize it and find a value system within medicines and, and to promote and make work, that correlates and, and there's a clear for, for medicinal benefits as I, I don't disagree that all theatre or performance practice is actually quite, not all, because some is quite torturous and traumatic actually. 
um, has medic medicinal benefits. Absolutely. That's certainly not what I'm, I'm not arguing that, that against that, if that makes sense. So I'm not, uh, your words spurred me, but I think at the core, we need to find the meaning of our theatre and why we make what we make and why we're doing right now. And I don't think that that should be be done because of um, a buzzword of this funding here or this funding there or this funding there. Because I feel like a lot of us have, have just gone and been commissioned by so many theatres, by so many venues, by so many houses. And I'm speaking culturally for myself here that um, uh, we've lost ourselves in some ways and we lo we've lost that core question of why do we do what we do um, but yeah that's a kind of response so it certainly wasn't anything directly relating to you as it were. I wanted to add something to both um, questions that um, Holly asked earlier on um, the first one um, no I'm sorry D did I did I say did I um, mix up people. Um, but the, the first one being uh, how, how we can organize ourselves or how our voices can be heard and it's not like I have any idea about that. But uh, I found one movement incredibly inspiring actually um, that has nothing to do with the arts at all but that gave me sort of uh, hope that uh, going out uh, can still generate change and that's what the Polish women have been doing and obviously that's a completely different subject but it's I thought that was quite strong really incredibly strong in in the within the context of um, their government policies to have this massive strength in the streets and then to actually uh, for there to be actually be consequences and change um, which is certainly where, where I come from in Luxembourg where we're quite I guess comfortable um, it was just a massive wake up call. And then the other thing re related to um, me media or ha um, social media or um, online performances or whatever, um, I, I, I sort of agree with the sort of the, 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 the nitty gritty of it is that we still kind of need to just very plainly have money in our accounts unless we also do other jobs. Um, that at the same time, I know for myself that I'm quite conflicted, so I don't know how, how other people feel, in that I'm actually extremely tired of looking at screens. And I, well, I didn't feel like that in, in um, March. And I think it's also a lack of education on my side in terms of, or maybe a lack of imagination to really grasp the possibilities of it. So I'm actually really, I'm, I'm both really interested in hearing what other people have been doing. And at the same time, I feel real, tiredness of sitting here with the same background for so many months and kind of even I'm not even sure I mean I think I'm supposed to look into the thing with the, the like the green lights but I kind of look at myself which is very odd I look at my own picture anyway so there are all of these new conventions I still struggle a, a lot with so these were just general thoughts Um, yeah, I suppose I just felt that um, I'm, I'm a playwright, and uh, when I when the first when the lockdown happened back in March, I kind of shut down mentally, and then as you know the grief and the shock kind of started to become normal, I started to work again then, and uh, but I had to start thinking about other ways of working. So um, for the first time, I wrote uh, or I uh, changed a play of mine to audio format. And it was um, recorded and broadcast from the stage of the Everyman Theatre in Cork. And it was one of the most positive experiences that I've ever had. And I suppose I'm just looking, uh, I'm looking at more um, the positive opportunities. I know that sounds ridiculous to be looking for positive opportunities during a pandemic, but in terms of work, I'm just looking at those other areas that I've never worked in before. And I wouldn't have the, uh, the hubris to think that I know anything about writing for screen because I've only ever written for live theatre. But I suppose I'm just looking at those other areas now. Um, and I have felt some resistance from other artists who just seem to be very 
no, I'm not going to do that. That's not my area, you know. Um, and I suppose I'm just, um, yeah, I'm feeling really positive about, about writing more for audio and for digital now and learning more about it and, and trying new things. So I just want to say, and thank you so much to all the speakers today. It was amazing. Thank you. On this note, I think we need to wrap it up because it's six o'clock. Um, so thank you all so, 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 so much. I cannot say enough thank yous for everybody um, joining and all the speakers. Um, and yeah, have a lovely evening and lots to reflect and think of.